Have you ever failed to recognize something that was valuable? As Stan Caffey prepared for married life, he cleaned out his garage and donated many of his possessions to Goodwill. One of the items he donated was a tattered copy of the Declaration of Independence that he had had hanging in his garage for a decade. Well, Stan's trash turned out to be another man's treasure. This particular version of the Declaration of Independence was a rare copy made in 1823. And a man named Michael Sparks spotted it and he purchased the document for $2.48. He later auctioned it for nearly half a million. Now that's not a bad profit. But it was about spotting something that was valuable. See, the one guy didn't have any idea, didn't think it was valuable at all, so he gave it away. Well, sometimes you and I possess something that's very valuable, but we don't recognize its value. And that's our influence. Our influence. And it's very powerful. It can do a lot of good, but on the flip side, it can do a lot of evil as well. I know most of us remember the children's song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Going to Let It Shine. See, that children's song, uh, the writer knew the power of influence. You may have already guessed where our text is this morning. It's in Matthew chapter 5, one that just about every Christian, every young person knows. Matthew chapter 5, this of course is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We'll begin reading in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. The city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now in our world, we don't think much about salt. <clears throat> it's just something we can go to the grocery store and find. And we don't think much about its value, but in the first century... Salt had a variety of functions, a variety of uses, and because of that, it was very highly valued. And sometimes Roman soldiers would actually be paid with salt. I mean, that, that's how they would receive their wages was in so much salt because it was so valuable. Well, if the Roman soldier didn't perform his duties well, people would say, well, he's not worth his salt. And that's where that comes from. Not worth his salt. Because that's what he was paid with. But he wasn't being very valuable. Christians add value to our society. I want us to remember that statement. Christians add value to our world. Without us, the world isn't as valuable as it could be. Think about that. That's value. An important purpose of salt, of course, is as a preservative. And it's been used for thousands of years for that purpose, as a preservative. Salt keeps meat from decaying and becoming rotten. Well, God's people keeps our world from becoming rotten and corrupt. Why? Because we're to influence the world for good. That's, that's one of the things we are to do as God's people. There's been many times in the history of the world where there were not enough good people, there weren't enough God's people to save it. Remember, that's what happened in the world before the flood. Bible said God, you know, God looked down on the world and people's thoughts were just only about evil continually. That's all they did was thought about evil. And out of the entire population of the world, which no doubt would have been in the millions by then, 
there was only eight people worth saving. Now think about that. Out of millions and millions, there were only eight people worth saving. How sad that the world had got into that state. And God said the only way to do this, the only way to preserve this world that I've made is to destroy it with water. And of course that's what he did. But he saved the salt. He saved the salt. Because there was too much evil in the world. That also happened in Sodom. Go back to Genesis chapter 13. Most of us remember this story about Abraham. <clears throat> Genesis 13. And the story about Sodom. In Genesis 13:13, 13, 13, these are the words we have. It says, The men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Now that describes what kind of people they were. Exceedingly sinful, extremely wicked. That describes Sodom. Well, if we go on to verse 18, then we see what's going to happen. Chapter 18 of Genesis, beginning in verse 22. <clears throat> then the man turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Well, then, of course, it kept going smaller and smaller and smaller, and it got down to, well, what about ten? Not even ten. So what did God do? Destroyed it. There weren't enough godly people to preserve it. This happened later with the Canaanites in Deuteronomy chapter 9. So there's been different times when there weren't enough good people for God to preserve a city or a country or a world. So as Christians, one of the things we do as salt is help preserve the world. Keep it from becoming more corrupt. That's part of what we're to do as Christians. Make the world a more righteous place. We're also to make the world, and, and we think we see this with salt, it's a seasoning agent. It enhances the flavor of food. Well, as Christians, we need to make the world thirsty for Christ. In other words, by knowing us and being around us and talking with us, people should want Christ. They should want the gospel. We should make them thirsty for it. We should make them hungry for it. Why? Because we're salt, and that's one of the things salt does. It's a seasoning agent. But how do we do that? If you season your food with salt, do you have your food on one side and then you put the salt over on the other? Well, of course not. That doesn't do any good. There has to be what? Contact. There has to be contact or it doesn't work. You actually have to put the salt on the food before it can become a seasoning agent. So as Christians, we cannot withdraw from society. We need to get more involved in society. Our, our, our school system, or our political system, our uh, media, whatever. The more Christians involved in politics, the better the political system will be. The more Christians in our school system, the better the school system will be. And on and on and on the list goes. Because we're a seasoning agent, we make things better. That, that's our job. By, by being Christians, God's people... We make the world better, more flavorful, a better place to live. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we see this when Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> 2 
2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. One of my favorite verses. Notice what Paul says. And it has so much to do with our, our influence and its power. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 2 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Notice the second part of the verse. And through us diffuses, all right, or spreads the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The fragrance of his knowledge. See, that, that's, that's our influence. That's how we interact with people when we talk with people. That's what we're doing. We're diffusing the knowledge of Christ everywhere we go. And again, that's everywhere. That's at school and that's at our workplace and that's at home and that's at everywhere. So that's why Christians need to be involved in those things to make the world better. To make the world a better place, more flavorful. And we want to be ready to talk with people about Christ, about their soul, about the afterlife. All of those things. <clears throat> There's something else salt does. Salt is an antiseptic. Yeah, we've been there, haven't we? Got a cut, put some salt on it. Does not feel good. But that's part of the healing process. So while it doesn't feel good, it's good for us. That's what salt does. It disinfects. Well, that's something Christians need to do. We need to help disinfect our world. And our world is very dirty. Our world is very sinful. Our world is very wicked. That means we cannot compromise on sin. If we compromise on sin, we're just adding to the problem instead of making it better. Salt makes it better. Painful, but the end product is better. The result is better. Why? Because we're doing what we should do. We need to be honest with people. Even when it hurts. Even when it stings. We need to be honest with people. Salt has a sting to it. The Bible tells us to be salt of the earth, not sugar of the earth. And it'd be easy to be sugar of the earth. Tell everybody that everything is fine. Everything is not fine. And, and it's not been fine, nor will it be fine. So salt has a purpose. It's part of that healing process, and we have to speak up. We can't compromise on sin in any way. Now, Jesus says there in Matthew that salt can become useless. Well, what's he talking about? Well, <clears throat> a lot of the salt in Palestine in the first century came from the Dead Sea. Well, that salt has a lot of impurities in it. In other words, it's not pure sodium chloride. It's not pure salt. It has lots of impurities. And so if it's not worked properly or, or processed correctly, then it becomes useless. In other words, it has a bad taste and it doesn't do these things that it's supposed to do. So it can become useless. And a disciple may lose these qualities that make him salt. If a disciple is not making people thirsty for Christ. If a disciple is not making the world a more valuable place by how he lives, then, he, then he's, using, he's losing his usefulness. And Jesus says, it's good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And that's what they would do with Saul that wasn't any good in the first century. They'd just throw it out and people would just walk on it because it, wasn't, it didn't have any value anymore. And it lost its value because it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. As salt, it had uses. It had purposes. Well, when, those, when, they weren't, when it wasn't being used, it, it lost that. The same with us. We can lose our purpose. We can lose our influence. We can. 
It can happen. So as salt of the earth, Christians are to be preserving and adding value and helping cleanse our world, our community, our town. It's part of who we are. We're also light of the world, he said there in the last three verses. And I want us to think about something. Christians are the only light of the world. We're, we're the only light of the world. There are, there are false lights and there are fake lights, but Christians are the only true light of the world. Think about that. The only ones. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5, when Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica, notice what he tells them. Chapter 5, verse 5. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 5.5 5. Now this is written to Christians and he says You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. What are Christians? We're the sons of the light. People outside the body of Christ are not sons of the light. So they cannot shed the light. And why is that? It's because we belong to Christ. And there, there's the real source of light. And we take that light and spread it to the world. But that's what Christians do because we're light of the world. In John chapter 1, remember these words uh, that John records? Very first chapter of John. <clears throat> Talking about Jesus in verse 9, John says... That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And because we're connected to the source of the light, then we can spread the light. That's who we are. We're to spread the light. Spread the knowledge of Christ. We're to light up a very dark, a very sinful world. Now as the world would say about Jesus... Sometimes the world doesn't want to be enlightened. The world wants to stay in darkness. Doesn't matter. Our job is still to light up the world. To show the light, show things that are wrong. That's what we have to do. Not fun, not enjoyable, but something we have to do. But to do this, again... We can't just stay in a corner. We have to get out. We have to get out. Christians have to be in the public. And something we should never, ever do under any circumstances is apologize for our beliefs. Because that dims the light. Never apologize for what the Bible teaches. Ever. Ever doesn't make any difference if people are offended or not. We cannot apologize for it. We're to show what's wrong with the world. We have to do that. That's part of what the light does. Because without the light, the world is dark and sinful. And if we're going to bring light to the world, that means exposing the darkness. Exposing the darkness. In Jesus' day, of course, homes were pretty small. And homes were lit by small little clay lamps. They found many of these uh, archaeologists have to fit in a hand. And, of course, they would burn oil. So if you would take one of these and put it on a stand and light it, it would pretty well light up the whole house because the houses weren't that, weren't that big. So just think about how many Christians extinguish their lamps when they go to school, or when they go to work, or when they go to sporting events, or when they go to community activities. They said, well, I'm just going to put my light out for now. I'll light it up later. Well, it doesn't do any good. The lamp doesn't do any good at all unless it's lit. Just having the lamp and having the oil in the lamp and having the lamp stand doesn't do any good at all until it's lit. And then it can bring light. 
And that's what we have to do. We're to bring light to the world. We're to show people who Christ is, what the church is, and that everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. We have to do what's good and right and true. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he told them something, something in Ephesians chapter 5 that's worth repeating. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 7, says, Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And then he goes on, he says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. He's writing to Christians, that's part of being light of the world, exposing the works of darkness. When something's wrong, according to the Bible, it's wrong. Period. Doesn't make any difference if so and so says it's right, or a court says it's right, or the law says it's right. That doesn't make any difference. If God says it's wrong, then it's wrong, and we need to expose it. But that's being light. That's who we are. We're the light of the world. Light dispels darkness. Darkness can be ignorance, it can be unbelief, it can be error, it can be immorality. If you stay there in Ephesians chapter 5, after saying, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, he says, For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Makes manifest revealed revealed Christians have a responsibility to expose these things for what they are and by exposing the things that are wrong then that autom automatically shows what's right in other words when you show something that's wrong then you now know what's right that's what the light does and that's why we have the Bible because it tells us what's light and what's darkness, what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. It, it tells us those things. And so we don't have to doubt or wonder because we have the light. We have the true source of light. We know what's light and we know what's darkness. So when we think of ourselves and our influence, questions like, Am I, make pe am I making people thirsty for Christ? What are some dark areas in my world that I can shine some light into? Do people I associate with know I'm a disciple of Christ? Do I bring glory by how I live my life? See, to be, to be light, we have to be plugged in, like I said, to the source of light. And by that, that means we, just like those people on Pentecost, ought to repent and be baptized. That places us into Christ, the source of light and the source of life. So before we can have the proper kind of influence, we must be in Christ. We must have had our sins washed away. And then to continue to be soul, to continue to be the light of the world, we need to continue to confess our wrongs. 1 John chapter 1. Yes, our influence is very valuable. Something we sometimes don't realize how valuable it really is. But it's extremely valuable. And we should never take it lightly. We influence people by what we say, what we do, where we go, what we don't do, and where we don't go. Our influence is valuable. This morning, if you're not plugged into the light, if you've not had your sins washed away in baptism, or if you need to have 
the prayers of the congregation to help you be stronger, then we ask you to come as we stand and sing this song.